Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter number 15. Psalm 15 tonight, if you have your Bibles. And thanks for being here tonight and coming back if you're here this morning. And if you weren't this morning, then welcome tonight. I love First Baptist Church. In fact, this morning I mentioned that I woke up surprisingly early for Time Change Sunday. I popped awake at 612. That would be 512 old time, right? And 612 new time. And was raring to go this morning. And it was feeling great. And I figured I'd drop down in a coma at 612 or so tonight or somewhere 6 o'clock tonight. And Johnny reminded me of that. But thankfully, I took a nap this afternoon. And I'm ready and raring to go. So we got a couple hours. I got a couple hours left inside of me tonight. And so you just hold on and we'll just go. And then whenever we're done, we're done. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, which will really be like the old time, 11 or 12 o'clock. So it'll just be wonderful. We won't know what time it is. Some of you probably misset your clocks anyway. So you don't, and, and, you know, and, and this clock is wrong. And so it's great. It says 1725. Is that right? Is that wrong? Military time? It's wrong, isn't it? It's, okay, so it's wrong. So I have an extra hour to preach tonight. Praise the Lord. Isn't, isn't God good? Wow, that wasn't a resounding yes. My goodness. Listen, I, I love this place, and I appreciate the music here. Thanks for the people who minister music and all who help with that. I am excited about this album. And listen, grab one tonight. There's no cost. There's a CD there. If you don't have a CD player, like some of you don't, there's a card there, too, on all the major streaming platforms. Just trying to get some good, wholesome, encouraging music out there. All right, and, and we, we love that here at First Baptist Church, and I'm glad to be a small part of that and glad to help push that, uh, push that forward and help the cause of Christ. Um, many people commented that they appreciate the music here, and I, I'm glad for that. I'm glad we don't have to put some smoke up here, other lights up here. We can just sing songs in honor of the Lord and uh, praise his name for that. And so, and uh, I'm thankful we still have a choir. A lot of places don't have choirs. We have a choir. We've got a good choir. We got, we got a great choir, and uh, boy, I'm glad for that. Looking forward to Easter morning here at First Baptist Church. That's going to be a great day. I tell you right now, I'm looking forward to what God will do. Last year, we were up here and up there and all over the place filled out here, and I'm going to encourage us and challenge us to work again for that, that we invite. People are going go to go to church on Easter, and so I'm praying they'll come here because here they're going to hear the gospel. Right, that I know because I'll be speaking that morning, and I'm going to make sure the gospel is front and center, but also the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll be praying about Easter Sunday. Of course, be praying about the, the TV broadcast as well. well. We'll be on three stations that morning, a little different format on TV uh, than we've done in the past. And so I may even let you uh, see that at a different time. Maybe Sunday night we'll play that broadcast, just a little different look. And, uh, but the big push, all right, billboards, got them, already got them lined up, and they're starting, uh, Brother Gold, when they start? A couple weeks, two weeks? Tomorrow, they're starting tomorrow. Uh, billboards on I-75 and 675, it'll have that big, uh, that big picture of a bunny rabbit. All right, and before you vote me out of the church, the caption on that is Easter is more than a bunny. All right, there's actually no bunny in, in Easter at all, in case you're wondering. All right, um, but uh, hopefully we'll encourage people. And all those things, we'll do our part here as a, as a staff and the volunteers here to do the billboard and make sure everything's printed and on social media. But all that does is pave the way. It'll pave the way. And the number one reason people come to church, number one, and it's not only First Baptist Church, it's every church, number one reason people come to church is not because they've seen you on Facebook, not because they've seen the billboard, not because they've seen you online or on TV, though that happens. We have people coming right now who have seen us in those places. But the number one pe pe reason people come to church is because someone invites them personally. And you may think, what's the good? What will it matter? And you don't know. And you don't know that God's already paved the way for your invitation. We got a wonderful couple coming, and um, they've been coming Sunday mornings. And if they're watching, God bless them. They watched us on TV, and two weeks ago, three weeks ago, they decided to come to church and check us out. But they said this back in August or so last fall: two young men came to their door and invited them to First Baptist Church. Now we don't know which two young men that that was. It could have been young men like my age, young men. Okay, could be young men like teenagers or young fishermen, and I'm glad we don't know. Because I love the scripture. We plant and we water, but it's God who gives the increase. We got to do our part. All right? And as a church, it, with me, uh, with the social media, I will try to do our part paving the way, but I'm going to ask you to do your part. 
And take those invitations and invite those friends, those coworkers, those neighbors, and we're going to pray that God will do something powerful on Easter Sunday here at First Baptist Church. Wouldn't it please the Lord to see this place packed out? Would it not? And to see people saved for his kingdom? That pleased the Lord. We're going to pray that direction. Well, Psalm 15 tonight, if you would in your Bibles, I love First Baptist Church. I love Sunday nights because we can really jump into the word of God. I, I want this ministry to not just be defined by good music, though I hope we continue to have good music here. But I want us to, to be defined by the Word of God. I want us to dig deep into the Word of God. I hope that you're defined, that I'm defined by a strong knowledge of the Bible. All right, you want to know the Word. That'll keep you from error. When someone uh, spouts something that, that is wrong, be, if you know the Word of God, it'll help you identify, wait a second, that's not a right philosophy. Because God's word says this, you ought to have a deep knowledge, but you also ought to have a passionate love for the word of God. And I hope you love this book. If I can, just not to, to, to minimize it, can I just tell you, it's a really cool book. I'm not trying to minimize it, but man, it, it's amazing. The stories I get to read in here, unbelievable. And the fact that written, written thousands of years ago, and it still touches me today, Still steps on my toes tonight? Oh, my goodness. And the fact that it can help me and help my, my sons and my daughter and my wife, it can help you whether you're an elderly saint or a brand new young Christian. It's a really cool book. It has the answers for life's problems. It's not a self-help manual, but I guarantee if you love the Bible, it'll help you. And we ought to have a deep knowledge of it, a passionate love for it, and we ought to have a firm commitment to follow it. It's not enough just to know it. Knowledge puffeth up. And sometimes Christians get so consumed and so enraptured with their knowledge of the Bible. They're like, oh, we know so much and we can quote so much and we can do so much. But you look at their life and you see that none of it matches up. Tonight in Psalm chapter 15, we're going to look at some characteristics of what I believe the Bible tonight is going to give us some characteristics of what a godly individual will look like. In the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 15, we're going to read some things that at the end, when we pull together the New Testament, you're going to say, well, they, they strangely go like, just like this. Kind of like, if I can, like the same author wrote the whole book. Psalm chapter 15, beginning in verse number one, we see a very provoking question. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy tabernacle? holy hill. Lord, I pray that tonight during this message that you would help me as I speak. Or the truth would be clear and plain from your scripture. Lord, those things that would not please you or honor you, I pray that you'd strike from my mouth and my mind now. Lord, I've tried to do my part and study and pray, but Lord, we need you and I need you tonight. Lord, I pray that your word would not return void like you've promised, that it would fall upon the hearts that are receptive to it. And Lord, I pray that everything that you wish to accomplish in the hearts and lives tonight would be accomplished. That we would not stand in the way or be obstinate, rebellious, and reject your truth. But we'd embrace it and follow it, Lord. Lord, I pray that tonight that the fruit from this service would be eternal. That it would have uh, uh, just many, many repercussions because we follow your word, Lord, and far past the time we remember who was here and what was sung and who was speaking, we would remember the truth from your word or touch us and change us. Lord, I love you. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask. Amen. The question is posed. The psalmist asks this question, Lord, who will be, who will abide in thy tabernacle? Who will dwell in thy holy hill? I imagine if you've spent any time in the Word of God, you've come across this particular verse, this passage, and read it, and maybe you've kind of wondered, like, what kind of question is that, Lord? Like, who's going to be in your tabernacle? Who's going to be in the holy hill? Interesting question that the psalmist would ask God, the Creator, Jehovah. So, Lord, who, who is qualified, in a sense, to be in your dwelling place? The tabernacle before the temple was the physical place all right, where God would be at. Then the temple was built, and that was the physical representation. But now as Christians, we are the temple of God. So the Bible says, 
And the psalmist asks the question, Lord, who is going to dwell in this? Who is worthy, in a sense? Who is qualified to be in this place where you're at? Now, if you were to study your scripture and study the laws, you would find out that God was very, very particular about who could access the tabernacle and the temple. In fact, if you accessed it in the wrong way, God would typically kill you. He did not do this out of spite or out of some type of uh, minor, you know, just irritation. It was because he is holy. He's holy. He's defined by holiness, and he's the picture of holiness, and he really cares how we approach him and worship him. We see that from the first pages of Scripture. You just can't approach God any old way you want to. It's one of my issues with the current worship movement. I feel in some ways that people are approaching it just, and, and, and I feel, I just feel how I feel, that they approach it with, well, God should be happy because we're worshiping him. Kind of like Cain and Abel. Well, I brought my own gift. God, just deal with it. And God, from the early page of Scripture, says, no, this is what I want. Now, worship me in my way. God has not hidden himself from us. He's not made this a secret. He's told us uh, how to worship him. And here, the question is asked, well, who will abide with you? Or who will be in eternal glory with you? The answer that we're going to see in just a moment, I believe, is characteristics of godliness. Understand that the answer is not a checklist, and then we are now spiritual. That would be the furthest thing from the truth. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell, where we can just do a few things, and then that equals righteousness. My Bible says that all my righteousness, there is filthy rags. There is none that do it good. So we must understand that in this context, as we work through it, you're going to see some descriptions, but don't miss the fact that we'll see these descriptions, these characteristics, these qualities cannot come without the power of God in the life of an individual. In a sense, we'll see these are some ingredients that when someone is walking with God will be evident in their life. This past Friday night, I got the opportunity to take my daughter out on a date, a daddy-daughter date, and she wanted to go to Olive Garden. We had a great time. Just in a side note, parents, you can date your kids. Spend some time with them. That's all right. Husbands and wives, you can date each other. You ought to date each other. I may just change my message and stay here for just a moment. Some husbands and wives are sliding away from each other right now. Listen, you ought to date each other. We got uh, Brother Jordan and Leah, right? They're here from Florida and pray for her grandmother's going through some health issues. They've been married three months. Look how close they're sitting in church. God bless them. God bless them. They still like each other. Amen? You can date each other. Single people in the church, you can date. Young people, don't think about it. Friday night, though, I was on a date with, with Danielle. I went to Olive Garden. That's what she wanted. We got some food and went to Barnes & Noble, spent a little time there, and her favorite animal right now is snow leopards. They're my favorite animal, too. I will not go through all the, the characteristics of why I like snow leopards, but she didn't like that. Her most often repeated response was, Dad, I don't know why she would say that. Apparently, I tend to joke. I don't understand that. But then, but then I said, well, let's, let's grab a treat for dessert at, at uh, Barnes & Noble, the little Starbucks center there in Barnes & Noble. And I walked, and I saw something there that I'd had before. The first time I had this treat, I was on a trip, and I was in a Delta Sky Club, and I saw this little package, and it caught my attention because it was a Rice Krispie treat. Now, I had Rice Krispie treats as a child. They were not a sought-after dessert. It's like cereal with some kind of goop in it. So when I was at this, this, the Delta, the, the, the Sky Club, and I saw this Rice Krispie treat in a package, I thought, well, what did they do to elevate this particular dessert? I saw on the package it said, brown butter Rice Krispie treat. Well, listen, I like butter. <laughs> okay, hello. So I opened it that day, and I took a bite of that brown butter Rice Krispie treat, and I'll tell you right, I'll tell you right now, it was delicious. Friday night, I walked past a little kiosk there in Barnes & Noble, and they had a little package there, brown butter Rice Krispie treats. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. 
I'm buying it. I'm buying I'm buying. They had two. They only had two there. And then I had even a better thought, a compelling thought. I don't know if it's from the Lord, but I'm going to take this from the Lord. I thought, we should go make a whole pan of these things. I said, Danielle. Mom was out with the boys. I said, do you want to go make some brown butter Rice Krispie treats? Of course, Danielle's like, Dad. No, she didn't. She goes, yeah. So we ran over to Meyer, right there. And uh, notice I said that correctly. We bought ingredients for Rice Krispie treats. And not just any Rice Krispie treats, brown butter Rice Krispie treats. We came home and Danielle and I, before the boys and Doreen got home, made these brown butter Rice Krispie treats. If you've never had brown butter Rice Krispie treats, I hope that after church tonight you will stop by Kroger or Meyer and buy the four ingredients you need. Rice Krispies, marshmallows, butter, and vanilla. That's it, baby. That's all there is to it. And I tell you right now, you put those in a good combination, whew, just in case you wonder how they turned out, they're gone. <laughs> Johnny came home. He was in another. He came home, and we told him like, "Hey," and he said, ah, "I'm really full." Saturday morning pops up for a youth conference, and he tries one, and he goes, "Can I have another one?" He said, "Dad, these are really good." But we got the ingredients for this particular dessert that would comprise what we wanted to make. I didn't buy, I didn't buy dog food because it would not have fit. It wasn't one of the ingredients I needed for the dessert. And the question is asked here, Lord, who will abide in, or who will dwell and who will abide in thy tabernacle and dwell in thy holy hill? And we're going to see four, I believe, four ingredients, if I can, four characteristics that God, all right, will give to us that ought to compose and ought to be revealed of those who will partake of his eternal glory. Let's look at the scripture and let's see what God gives to us tonight as these ingredients tonight. Psalm 15, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? We see the first one in verse number two. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Each of these next four verses, I believe, brings us one different, each a different characteristic. The first characteristic that I want to point out in verse number two is this characteristic. Someone... Who, will, who has and will partake of God's eternal glory, will be genuine toward God. Genuine toward God. He that walketh uprightly, that means lives a life of sincerity. Not a sincere life before man, but before God. You understand that God sees everything? He sees every bit of our decisions, our choices. He sees our motivations. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And he still loves us. And he answers the question of who will dwell, but the man that walks uprightly, who is sincere and genuine in his heart, he works righteousness. That means that has the idea. He's not satisfied to live this life, this sincere life, with a half-hearted effort. And the idea is that this, this individual doesn't just do something all right, of righteousness and say, well, that's good enough. It's not like math homework. Well, that'd be good enough. Teacher will like it. It's not like chores. It's not like too often how we live. The man who will dwell in the tabernacle and abide in the holy hill. It's going to be a man who's genuine toward God. He walks uprightly, that works righteousness, and speaketh the truth. What does it say? What are the last three words? Help me here. What are the last three words? Here? One more time. Where? In his heart. Understand that where this begins is right where it should begin. That right here, right here is right with up there. You see, we can't begin to dwell in the tabernacle and, and taste of the eternal glory if we're not right, right here. 
It's not just out here. This is a reflection and should be a reflection of what's in here. That's what he says. He walks uprightly. He's sincere and genuine. He works righteousness and he speaks truth right here. You know, my Bible also tells me this, and so does your Bible, that the heart is deceitful. It's deceitful above all things and it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? And Jeremiah asked that question and it's answered. I, the Lord. You know who knows if we're genuine right here? God. God knows. You ever had your motivations questioned? Anyone ever ever interpreted an action you've done incorrectly? Well, I know why you're doing that. You just want to be up front. I know why you're doing this. You're just trying to get in good with that crowd. I know why you're doing that. And and have your, your motivations falsely assumed? It can be hurtful. It can be irritating. And sometimes you can't even have a de- defense for it. Well, no, no, no. My, my intentions were genuine. And, and almost the more that you defend yourself, the, the less genuine you appear and sound. I'm like, I promise I'm genuine. I'm not lying. Hmm, he thinks he does protest too much. Right? But God knows if we're genuine. And here, the, the writer gives to us this thought. Listen, who will, will be in this eternal dwelling? Listen, the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, who is genuine, sincere in their heart. Sincerity. I mean, we may not be able to always control what other people think. We can always be genuine. And he knows He knows. When she doesn't, when he doesn't, when they say this, this person says this, he knows. He knows. And we may not be, if I can, right this side of heaven, but we can, with a pure heart toward God, right that side of heaven. I want to be genuine toward God. This is the Pharisees' problem. They were so concerned about genuine toward other people. They hit everything right here. And God says, he says, you are just whited sepulchers. You're just tombs. You're dead. You're so consumed out here. You've missed what's here, the weightier matters of the law and what's happened on the inside. And here it begins that we are right in our hearts. But go on, not only are they genuine toward God, number, number two, the second ingredient is found in verse number three. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Not only is someone genuine genuine toward God, but number two, they're respectful and compassionate toward others. They're respectful and compassionate toward others. This word, he that backbiteth, If you were to look it up in your Bible and find out other places that it is used, it is often translated in the most unique way possible. In fact, when I was studying this particular verse and I looked up where else this word was used in the Old Testament, it surprised me. I think you know the idea. Someone who backbites is someone who's kind of maybe trying to cause a little problem. And search out some issues with other people. But here's the word that the Bible often uses. You ready for it? The word spy. Over and over again, this word. If you're looking up tonight, you'll find out. It says, and they spied out the land. They went to Ai and they spied. It's this word right here. You see, someone who is, has, is a partaker of the eternal glory is not trying to spy and look for dirt on other people. That's good, isn't it? Come on, I'm looking at that, I'm like, spies. Man, we're guilty of that. Some of you do it on Facebook. You lurk. Look at, look at that. Look. Hmm. Hmm. That's not genuine. I know them. That's fake. That hair color's fake. That car is fake. That smile's fake. That family's fake. Spying. Come to church and look around. Look at them trying to act all all pious over there, carrying that Bible in, sitting right there. I know them. I remember them when they were in high school, 74 years ago. (laughs) 
And I remember the one time that they didn't give the three cents back to the lunch lady. Spying. Look at their kids. <laughs> They're not that perfect. In fact, I saw them once. I saw them once run in the auditorium. Heaven help us. Heaven help us. Look at that car they're driving. You've heard that before. I see where their treasures are. This side of heaven. Look at that house. Look at that promotion at work. They're compromising. Listen, Christians, we are guilty of this all of the time. You, you see another church, and, and maybe that church is having some blessings. I talked about this a few weeks ago. And instead of, of appreciating the blessings, we attribute it to the devil. We say they're compromising. Obviously, they're not pleasing the Lord. The only other option is pleasing the devil. Right? There's only two forces in this world. We're living for God or we're not. And so if God is not blessing, then, then the devil is. In fact, Jesus had this accusation. He cast out demons. And the Pharisees said, well, you cast out demons because you're, you're the prince of demons. By Beelzebub, you cast out demons. And Jesus basically says, what? Time out. He says, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. All right, I'm paraphrasing your King James Bible for you. But my friends, we're guilty of the same type of spying. We're, we're, we try to be genuine here, but toward others, we're like, why are they getting ahead? They, they can't be better than me. Why are they being blessed? They can't be a better Christian than I am. I know them. They're human just like me. And my goodness, someone who has partaken of the heavenly blessings, someone who has been touched by the grace of God ought to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. I still remember we had a, we had a family here, husband and wife, and man, they were a blessing here. They helped me in the youth group. Remember the one time that they sold their business and bought a new car. God bless them. God bless them. I don't know if they tithed or not. I have no idea. I was just a youth pastor. I went up to him and I said, Brother so-and-so, man, that's a nice car. He looks at me and he says, Man, Pastor J.D., thanks for saying that. He said, Some people have made some comments because we've got this new car. Really? In a church? In a church? You see, he asked, who will dwell? Who's going to dwell in the tabernacle? Who's going to abide in the holy hill? You know, someone who's genuine in their heart toward God, because without being right here, you won't be with God. If you're not right with God, but I tell you what, one of the ingredients of a, someone who's been touched by God, they'll have a respect and a compassion toward others. They're not looking for dirt. They're looking for help. This verse goes on, talks about interacting with respect and covering with respect. Someone said this, the chief sin of the church is gossip. More damage has been done to the church and its work by gossip and slander than by any other single sin. There's a man in the 17th century. In the 17th century, a few hundred years ago, he said this, pity your brethren. As other Christians, pity or have compassion upon fellow Christians. Let it suffice that godly ministers and Christians are loaded with reproaches by wicked men. There is no need that you should combine with them in this diabolical work. He says, listen, what he's saying is, there's enough people who will try to reproach the name of Christ. So as a Christian, as someone who has partaken of the heavenly blessings someone who claims to love God, don't join hand in hand with the reproaches. A genuine toward God. There's respect toward others. Look, please, quickly in verse number four. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned. But he, that, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He's honest in judgments. Reminded of a particular passage in Isaiah where the Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. My friends, we live, we live in a day and age where people are calling evil good and good evil. Wednesday nights we're dealing with that series on, rele on being relevant and just some of those issues and right now on the transgender issue. 
And there were issues all over the place. I read today about a young man who was arrested. He was arrested because in his school, in his Catholic high school, he dared to say, as the Bible says, that God made male and female. They kicked him out of school. When he went back, they arrested him. They arrested him. We live in a time where people are calling good evil and evil good. And I wish it was just outside of those who don't know God. But my friends, it happens even in the house of God. People who claim to be preachers of the word of God. They call themselves pastors and they are calling good, evil, and evil good. We are inside of that right now. And here this verse says, listen, who's going to dwell in the tabernacle? Who will abide in the holy hill? Those who, who understand who understand right and wrong as defined by God. That's what it says. They, 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 they condemn the vile person, but they honor them that fear the Lord. They understand right and wrong. They understand that the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom. They understand that. There's honesty. They're fair. And last verse number five, the last characteristic. They're satisfied. Look at this verse he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. You say, well, well, why would, well, why would the Bible even talk about this and the fact that someone trying to get some interest on some money, isn't that investment and stewardship? No, the idea here is that someone who is partaking of God's blessing is satisfied and content. He's not looking to eke every single penny out of his fellow man. He's not looking to make sure he just gets ahead. He has a higher purpose and a greater vision. All right, he's got a greater calling in life. In fact, the psalm closes with this statement. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. This person has God's grace in and on their life. But it is only by the grace of God that you and I can be genuine toward God. Without his grace, we have nothing. It is only as we reveal his love toward others and showcase his love that we can have true respect toward them. We find out and when we read about God's love that that's what bears all things, hopes all things, and believes all things. It is only with God's mercy and his judgment in view that we can have true fairness and honesty and understanding in our judgments and dealings. And it is only in him that we can truly be content, satisfied, and steadfast. Ecclesiastes says this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Jesus in Matthew says this, and one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, attempting him saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, if you know it, help me, with all thy heart, soul, and mind. It sounds genuine, doesn't it? Doesn't it? This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It sounds like respect toward others, does it not? On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. James says, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Sometimes you'll go in the cash register if you happen to have cash, which every once in a while I do carry some cash, you'll hand a bill to a, a teller or to a cashier. You'll take that bill, a 20 or a 50, usually not a 10 or a 5, and sometimes they'll hold it up to the light. Right? What are they doing? Well, they're trying to see if it's real or not, right? Trying to see if there's a little slip in there that says, oh, this is a real this is a real legal tender of the United States government. I can accept this. This is valuable. Or if you had drawn one before you got there on a piece of notebook paper and it said, you know, 13,000, 
She'd look at that and smile and give it back to you and say, nice, nice try, sir. See, sometimes as Christians, we try to pass off ourselves as this $13,000 bill. And God says, listen, who will dwell in my tabernacle and abide in my holy hill? Let me tell you, someone who's genuine toward me, ingredient, characteristic. Someone who will showcase that love and respect toward others. Someone who will be fair and honest in their dealings. And someone who will be understanding in their judgments. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that if you have them, you're a Christian. I'm not saying that if you don't have them, you're not a Christian. But what I am saying is that God says that those who will be with him who have tasted of his glory, who will be in his eternal glory, that place of dwelling. He says, these are the characteristics. So tonight, if God were to describe the ingredients of your life, is this the list that he would use of your life? On Friday, I went to make brown butter rice krispie treats. And I brought the ingredients that would make those Rice Krispie treats. Rice Krispies, marshmallows, butter, and vanilla. And everything that I didn't need, I didn't take. Everything that didn't have a part of that, dog food, dirt, plastic, whatever it may be, was left on the shelf. Because it wasn't part of what I wanted to make. And in your life tonight, there may be some things that you need to put back. That don't have a part of your life. That don't reveal God's grace in your life like he said would reveal his glory and grace. And if you don't have the right ingredient there, then by God's grace, put that aside. And let him fill you with his grace and mercy and love and judgment. And he will be in your life that grace and power. And you will be for him that wonderful testimony. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. They're going to see these things. And when they see these things, you know what they'll do? Glorify God. Your father, which is in heaven, the place of his dwelling. What ingredients are in your life?